Dawkins, our green, uh, the Green Party's candidate for governor right. for 2014. So we actually didn't talk about what I should talk about. Um, maybe I should give you the five minute stump speech and then talk about getting organized. Does that make sense? Okay. Today they are down in Texas uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And the year before that, there was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. And they knew they were going to win the civil rights, and then the question was, how do we enjoy the blessings of liberty if we don't have the economic means? And they put forward a number of demands related to employment and income security and health care and housing and schools. And they're actually demands that put a little more meat on what Franklin Roosevelt had called for in 1944 State of the Union Address for his second Economic Bill of Rights. And in the March in Washington, the leadership, A. Philip Randolph, who was president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and by Rustin, who was with him, they were members of the Socialist Party, a small third party that really organized that march. And Martin Luther King and the civil rights leadership, they all knew that in order to have security of civil rights, they had to provide economic security for everybody. Because the thing that has divided working people in this country historically has been racism. And whites felt competition from blacks. There was mechanization in agriculture. They had moved up north to get factory jobs. Now automation was coming in. And people were already losing jobs. The same things were facing the day in a much more extreme form they saw were coming. So they put forward these demands and a few years later put out a freedom budget through which Congress could have done these things. And Johnson had called a war on poverty, but he lost that war in Vietnam. And that's where the resources went. And now we have a military budget that is, in real terms, as great as it's ever been since World War II. And we don't have, you look around our cities upstate, what, Rochester is the third poorest, fifth poorest? Okay. Well, we're all in the top five. Rochester is the fifth poorest, Buffalo is the third poorest, and my hometown of Syracuse is poorer than Detroit, which is number one of the 75 biggest cities. We're number 175. And like Detroit, our poverty rate is over 38% overall. For children, it's 55%. Rochester, I think, is around 30. 47. 47. Where you get the number from. Child poverty or overall? Child poverty. Child poverty. Okay, I'm talking about overall. 30. 32. Okay. I like that number. It's from the Census Bureau. Yeah, the, and the American Community Survey keeps updating those numbers, but that's the basic picture. Uh, taxes for working people are up and they're down for the rich folks. Unemployment is chronically higher than it was in 1963. Wages <laughs> on an hourly basis are lower. Most working people don't have the savings to retire comfortably. And you could go on and on. So we've had two political parties bankrolled by the big banks and corporations and the 1% that own them, and they've not solved these problems. So what we call for in the Green Party is a Green New Deal. And it starts with everybody willing and able to work ought to have the right to a useful job. And if they can't find it in the private sector, they should be able to go to their employment office not the unemployment office, and say, I want my job. And it can be in public works, building infrastructure, or public services providing for the needs that are defined by our communities, like the old Works Progress Administration. In that case, the federal government, we can do it in the state. State government would fund it through progressive taxation. Local communities would plan the projects, and they'd be on the shelf. So when unemployed people came in, we could put them to work. Second thing is living wages. I got a $15 an hour minimum wage pin. We want to get to that at least and index it to inflation. And people go, oh my God, you know, 15, that's over double what the federal minimum wage is. But you know, in 1963, 
the March on Washington demanded a $2 minimum wage because they said that's what you need. Adjust that for inflation, today it's $15.29. So we're asking what we asked for in 1963. We want everybody to have access to health care. We want a Medicare for all system, expanded and improved. We can do it at the state level, a single payer public health care program. Everybody in, nobody out. At the point of provision of services, free to the provider. You give them the card and the provider bills the single payer fund. No co-pays, no deductibles, just health care. And we know from a 2009 study authorized by the state legislature that if we had gone that route, instead of the Individual Mandate Affordable Care Act, in New York State in 2018, the people of New York State would save $28 billion through a single payer system over what we're going to be spending on this individual mandate, which the reason for that is private health insurance. Every provider's got to fight the insurance company to get paid back. Every doctor's got to have two and a half staff people to do the paperwork. <laughs> Call up those cost accountants. You got cost accountants saying, don't provide the service that the doctor says they should provide. It's insane. So, and that, they called it national health insurance back in the days of the March on Washington. Desegregated, fully funded quality education for everybody. That was another demand in 1963. And that's what we want today. This state is balancing its budget on the backs of school children. It's called a gap elimination adjustment, which is a bureaucratic way of saying we're going to cut the funding for the schools in order to balance the budget and pay for these tax cuts for the rich, which we just got more in the latest austerity budget from the governor and the legislature. They cut the estate tax. They eliminated the bank tax. They got these tax-free zones for manufacturers. Uh, and so that's how they're paying for it. So they're transferring wealth from working people to the super rich. Our state has the most unequal distribution of wealth in the country. In 1980, the top 1% got 30% of all income. Today, they get between 30 and 35%. Those are the numbers since 2007. They've more than tripled their share of income. Meanwhile, the bottom 99% has lost ground. It's probably the bottom, you know, maybe 85% that's lost ground, and then the next 14% has pretty much held their own, and the 1% has shot up. So we're in a situation today where the average income of the bottom 99%, which is 40,000 something, is 1 40th of what the 1% makes. They make their average income is 1.7 million a year, the 99% average income is 40,000 something. And this is the kind of distribution of income they didn't even have in the Middle Ages. It's got so extreme. So, education. We only, not only want fully funded education, we got, here's some other figures. Uh, Civil Rights Project just came out with a study. We have the most segregated schools by race and class in the United States. We're worse than Mississippi now, and it's been getting worse in New York State. Uh, division between Poor districts, like inner city districts and some of these rural districts and the suburbs, uh, becomes a barrier to access to education. So you concentrate poor people with low incomes and segregate them and then underfund their schools and you're going to get low test scores. The thing that test scores best predict is what kind of family you came from, what your background is. And then they put this high stakes testing regime down on them and they use that to fail the children, their teachers, and their schools. You end up closing a school like East High School, and you start charterizing schools, privatizing schools. And, you know, they're not, they're not doing that to the schools in Scarsdale, it's to the poor schools. And there's $500 billion publicly spent on public schools, and the hedge fund investors want a piece of that. There's a tax credit where they can double their money in seven years. And so you get these hedge fund guys on the boards of like the Success Academies down in New York. You've heard the controversy about that. And they plop $800,000 in Andrew Cuomo's lap as part of his campaign contribution. And he turns around and he gives them money out of the state budget, out of this controversy in New York City. So we want to opt out of high stakes testing. Common Core, which is a curriculum developed by the Pearson Corporation, not the teachers. And opt into full funding, desegregation, and bringing the teachers back as those who set common standards, we do need standards, 
right test for diagnostic purposes, not this high stakes mm -hmm. testing, and, and respect the teachers and support them, not say they're the problem and find ways to fire them, take their unions from them. The more we attack teachers, the less likely good teachers are going to get into the profession. Because anybody got any brains knows that's not going to be good if you don't have job security mm -hmm. and respect. So quality education, I dwelled on that because it, what I'm hearing from the voters and the people that I'm talking to is that's the big issue. Parents are angry, teachers are angry, and we're not going for 50,000 votes, we're going for at least 250,000 votes. If we get that, it'll be the most votes for any independent party on the left in New York history. So when we come out of this election, we want the media and the public, when they want to talk to the left, the progressives, they talk to us, who are independent of their corporate money and influence. They don't go to the Liberal Democrats or to their second ballot line, the Working Families Party. They come to us because we're not being heard. Working people in the state mostly don't vote, and when we do, we're taken for granted. You know, you vote on the second line for the same people, and what does that tell those politicians? You know, Working Families will tell you it sends them a message to be progressive. I think it sends a message to the politicians. Geez, they're going to vote for me even though we're kicking them in the butt. You know, they take us for granted. We run independently, they got to compete for us on the, on the policies we're putting forward, and if we get votes, they're going to say, well, we better move, or, you know, we're going to lose to those parties. That's been the historic role of third parties, from abolition, suffrage, Social Security, the gains we got with the New Deal and the Great Society, it was because there was that independent threat, the populist movement, the socialist movement, the progressive third parties. So, what makes it a Green New Deal is because we want to add to the rights that Roosevelt enumerated, the March on Washington raised. We want to raise the right to a clean environment and a safe climate. And the core of our demand there is we want the state to commit to 100% renewable energy, clean energy, by 2030. We have a study out by a consortium of scientists and engineers and economists led by Mark Jacobson of Stanford, including Anthony and Graffia and Robert Howard at Cornell, Janet Barth, who's an economist in New York. And they looked at New York State and said, how can we get to 100% renewable energy? And they found it is technologically and economically <coughs> feasible to do it in 15 years. They said 17 years, 2030. Um, and that came out in 2013. And what they found also was, that's our full employment program. It'll take four and a half million jobs to build that system out. We're basically going into a third industrial revolution from the highly centralized production of energy and centralized corporations to a decentralized, distributed generation of power. Every building, every home, every factory, every office, solar rooftops, micro wind, they generate power. They're, they're small power plants. And then instead of a one-way grid going out from central power plants, you have an interactive grid. So when you have surplus power, you put it on the grid, or you put it in hydrogen fuel cells and store it right there. So the power is distributed, the ownership and control is distributed, it democratizes the whole energy system, and it basically creates an internet of energy, you can think of it that way. That is where we ought to be on the cutting edge. New York could show the way. You know, we led the way on the New Deal when uh, Roosevelt was governor and Harry Hopkins was doing public works jo uh, jobs programs in New York State, then they took it nationally when they went to the presidency. We would like to see New York lead the way again into this third industrial green industrial revolution. So that's the core of the program. Now usually the first question is, oh, that's all nice, how are you going to pay for it? Well, if we just went back to the tax rates we had in the 1970s, we could pay for it. We could more than pay for it. We could provide property tax relief as well. And I'll just give you a summary. $30 billion more in revenue than we got now. First of all, we go back to the progressive income tax we had then. The first dollar you earn now, you pay 4% on it. Back then, you paid 2%. And then if you're making over $2 million a year, that was the top bracket. That was over 15% back then. Now it's 8.82%, but that's temporary. It'll go back to 6.85%. Now, if you're an individual, you reach 6.85%, that top tax bracket that Bloomberg and Trump and those guys pay, when you get to $20,000, that's a $10 an hour job full time. So it's really a flat tax and it's progressive as you get to your full time rate, you know, your full time hours, which for a lot of people is a problem because there's so much involuntary part time work. Okay, we go back to that progressive tax structure we had in the 70s, 95% of us would pay less in income taxes. We get a cut. 
and that top 5% and particularly top 1% paying more would generate $8 billion more in revenue. That's number one. Number two, corporate welfare. We hardly had any in the 70s. Now we have $7 billion a year. And Cuomo's own tax commission, he set up two of them, didn't like what the first one was doing, so he formed another one to try to get the right result. And they did a study, well, how much is this corporate welfare getting us? This is tax breaks and subsidies. And they found that the companies that got it since 1994, when, when it really got ramped up, it began to get ramped up, uh, have lost 175,000 jobs. So that whole philosophy that both Cuomo and Astorino share of give the rich more money by tax breaks and they'll invest and it'll trickle down to us, uh, it hadn't trickled down. Um, so I was just up in Buffalo. We went in front of an abandoned building because we heard Cuomo was in town. He seemed to be following me today. First he was here, <laughs> I get up there, and then he was there. All right, he got up there in about 45 minutes. He must have had a helicopter. Um, and he said, we got cranes out. He put a billion dollars into Buffalo, but that was for his friends. So we went out in one of the neighborhoods. You got him here. We got him in Syracuse, abandoned housing, thousands and thousands of abandoned homes and said, Cuomo, you better come out here to the neighborhoods and see what's really going on. So that's $7 billion, we could say. Now we're up to 15. And then we got this tax called the stock transfer tax. It generates between 12 and $16 billion a year over the last few years. Last, well, about the last seven years now. And the reason for that is high frequency trading. That just a few firms do, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and they basically jump ahead of the line. They can read the trades going on. It's computerized insider trading. In fact, Schneiderman, our Attorney General, and the Department of Justice are beginning to investigate it. And it puts the small investor at a disadvantage. But anyway, that's why the, the revenue is so high. It's just pennies uh, per share per trade. But because there's so much trading, it generates all this money. But you know what? Since 1981, they've rebated it to the traders 100%. Okay, call that 15, just to have round numbers. We got $30 billion right there. That would pay for tuition-free higher education at public universities, CUNY, SUNY, and community colleges. That would cost $1.5 billion. We have a bill in the legislature for that. It's not moving, but say we don't have the money. Well, we know where the money is. The rich have it. We're not talking about soaking them. We're just talking about paying what they used to pay. That's how we pay for the Green New Deal. And... Uh, property tax relief. We pay more in property taxes than we do in income taxes. It's $51 billion in the state for property, $41 billion for uh, income. <coughs> income tax is more progressive. We should pay more of that to the state, and then the state should share the revenues with our cities. In 1979, the standard of uh, revenue sharing was 8% of state revenues. Today, it's less than 1%. You multiply the aid that your city is getting. I'll tell you Syracuse because there are no numbers. We get $72 million a year. Our operating budget was $299 million last year, adding the school budgets to $667. Multiply 72 million by eight, you get 568, I think. It's close, close, and basically almost double the resources we would have. And then we would have to close schools, senior centers, fire stations. We could prepare, prepare the roads, start replacing the water mains and the sewers, and uh, do the other things that we need to do in our cities. So, it's not that we don't have the money. The per capita gross state product is double what it was in 1980 when we started to go on this conservative economic path, the philosophy shared by both the Democrats and Republicans now. Tax cuts for the rich are a jobs program for us. I think that's worked. And deregulation <coughs> of public austerity is the road to economic recovery. Well, we're not recovering. So that's the outline of the program we're putting forward. Now, there are a lot of issues from you know, gun rights or gun safety to uh, fracking. We're against fracking, by the way. We want to ban it, not a moratorium. Let me just stop it with that, and I'll make that the last issue. You know, when I ran in 2010, um, I called for a ban. Half the environmental movement was saying natural gas from frack gas is the bridge to the renewable future. And I'm saying, no, you're locking yourself into decades of renewable fossil fuel infrastructure. And once people invest in that, they're going to want to return on their investment, and we'll never get to renewables. Um, and the other half of the environmental movement was saying a moratorium. Let's study it. And we were saying, and we got this from the anti-fracking movement in, in the southern tier, ground zero, uh, and these were members of the Green Party. One of them, a, a town board member, Mary Jo Long, down there in Afton. Uh, they said, no, we got to ban it, because we know it poisons the air, poisons the water, it destroys, it's an industrial thing that destroys 
tourism, fishing, hunting, vineyards, farms. It's not, it would destroy the economy we've got. It would be a boom and bust and would leave everything in wreckage. So we knew that, and then there was the climate impact. If we uh, extract the gas, and I did calculations on this, if we just extract the natural gas from the Marcellus Shale, we would bust the carbon budget, our per capita carbon budget in the United States. The carbon budget globally is the amount of carbon we can release in uh, <coughs> the limit that we can release to stay below two degrees rise in uh, Celsius in global temperatures to stay below the tipping point, or at least that's the international goal they've uh, established. It's probably too high to avoid it. You've got to even aim lower. Um, and that's just natural gas. It doesn't count the methane, which is much more potent. It's 100 times more potent over the first 20 years. And uh, so the, we shouldn't pass the gas. It should just stay in the ground. Um, so we raised that demand immediately after the election. It got such traction that a lot of the environmental groups, the liberal environmental money that funds people that come out and canvass for you and organize these demonstrations, they came out for a ban. Now it's the demand of the movement. So the Green Party already is making an impact. We did it with that. We did it with gay marriage. Our mayor and deputy mayor down there in uh, New Paltz did it in 2004 until a court injunction stopped him, but it put it on the agenda, and now we've got legalized same-sex marriage in New York State, marriage equality. So, and I could give you some other issues, but you get the point. If we don't speak and act for ourselves and make it an issue, that's the only way we're going to get heard. That's the only way we're going to move the political process. Uh, this idea of fusion, I call it political ventriloquism. It's like you're trying to get somebody else to say and do what you want. Don't work. We really establish ourselves as the alternative. You know, winning the, win the race, realistically, you know, it's, it's not the money Cuomo has. It's the tradition of people voting for a Democrat or Republican. They just inherit that. And most people vote with their guts without looking at the issues and even knowing what their options are. But over time, and I think I've got this from being in movements, a lot of times people dismiss you, but they hear you. In the back of their mind, they're like, saying, geez, they're right. And, you know, I, the first time I experienced this was the anti-Vietnam War movement. You know, we thought we were a small minority, and we were protesting, and people, you know, arguing and swearing at us and saying, get a job. And, you know, I'm 15, 16 years old. I did have a job, actually. <laughs> and uh, then Tet happened, and suddenly everybody kind of said, like, I grew up in a neighborhood that was blacks were the largest group, Mexicans next, Japanese, and then, uh, you know, Samoans, Tongans, and there was a little Italian group. And those Italian workers, most of them working at an auto factory in Fremont across the bay from where we live, you know, they were very super patriotic, they hated the anti-war movement, and then after Tet, all of a sudden they're all saying, you know, this is a bad war, you know, and their kids, some of them have been drafted and hurt. And so it flipped, and I think, you know, they knew we were right. It's just suddenly it became okay for them to say it was right. Um, the anti-nuclear movement, you know, I was involved in organizing the Clamshell Alliance, occupying the Seabrook nuclear power plant site, and we started with the polls saying, you know, 76% of New Hampshire people wanted Seabrook. And after we did that occupation, which got national attention, and then we went to town meetings and explained how Construction works in progress means you're paying for the plant before we even know it works. You know, those Rock Rib Republicans in New Hampshire say, no, that's not right. And then we pointed out the water they're drawing out to build the plant with, you know, the wells they had on the seacoast, they lose their water. They have to, you know, drill a new well. And so we won over people. And so within a few years, you know, at first they were calling us all hippies, you know, and tree huggers, and pretty soon they're all with us, marching with us. Um, Anti-apartheid movement, you know, that was something after Soweto in 76, all those children were shot, school children protesting, mm -hmm. uh, 600 of them. You know, we start saying we got to get the universities and the union pension funds and the church endowments to divest in order to pressure the government to impose sanctions. And Ron Dellums had a bill in 1973. And we did that for like eight years, in 1984. And I was up in New Hampshire and we put shanty towns up in the college green at Dartmouth College, which is kind of sacred ground. And it, it, it went national because the right-wingers came and attacked us with, you know, in the middle of the night with their uh, sledgehammers and whatnot. And there was a lot of stuff. Got a lot of controversy. Suddenly there's shanty towns on all the campuses. We got a crisis. Suddenly Congress moves. They pass Dellum's bill. Reagan vetoes it. They override Reagan. So, you know, what I'm saying is you got to keep 
agitating, organizing, educating, talking to people. And you may have convinced them when you don't really see that you have. Um, and that goes for the people that run the country. One more example, and then I'm going to keep quiet. Um, okay, we, we have this massive anti-war movement, but Nixon and Kissinger are still bombing the hell out of Vietnam. And now we know from their memoirs, when we did the moratorium in 69, where it was basically a general strike, millions of people in major cities took a day off work to march. And it was, you know, families, and we did it in October, and then a bigger one in November. The one in November scared the hell out of Nixon and Kissinger. They basically concluded if they executed their secret plan to end the war in Vietnam, which was to use tactical nukes against the North, they'd have a revolution. I think they overestimated our power, but we convinced them. Dave Dellinger, who was an activist from back then, some of you older folks may remember, he wrote a book called More Power Than We Know, which if you can find a copy, it would be worth reading. I think, you know, that should give us hope. So I can't guarantee we're going to get the 5%, the 250,000 votes, but I think it's within our reach, and, uh, you know, we got to try our best to do that, and it's worth the fight. So, what, questions and answers? Do you want to take over? Can you pass your process question?